Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you got me okay. Great. Good. Thank you. Okay. Looks like we got a small group today. Um, that's fine. Um, I want to talk to you guys about uh, lighting today. And uh, I just want to get sort of get set up here. Hopefully my uh, key light's not too bright. Um, let me share my screen with you. We'll get that going. Good, good. Okay. Um, all right. So we are on section 2.2, I believe it is. Let's see. Yep. yep. Lighting fundamentals. Here we go. So we've only got these two modules left, and this is uh, week six, right? So this is, uh, we've come to the end of this thing. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to mention to you guys. Um, so this is week six, right? And it is the 21st of June, right? So the uh, final quiz and the final uh, assignment, which is a lighting assignment associated with this module, which is not gear related and stuff. So don't worry about having to go to campus and check out a bunch of stuff. Um, it's a virtual assignment, which I think you'll uh, enjoy. Um, but all that stuff's going to come due Sunday of, uh, you know, at the end of this week, right? Sunday at midnight, right? Don't be late, because here's the thing, guys. Because the, the summer sessions are really kind of bunched up, um, I got to have your grades in like two days later. So, and it's going to take me that amount of time to make sure I have all the assignments uh, graded all of your attendance calculated properly, which is a time consuming thing. Um, and I have to make sure that all my ducks in a row are in a row in order to turn your grades in. So you can't be late, okay? Um, unless there's some kind of cataclysmic emergency, I'm not gonna take anything after Sunday at midnight because Monday I'll be gathering everything to turn grades in by Tuesday afternoon, okay? So there's no wiggle room here. Okay, uh, I just want to put that out there now. Okay, uh, if you're behind on something and you owe me something and we've talked about it in the emails and stuff, please get it in. Don't uh, don't procrastinate because um, uh, UCF is going to want all of your information like immediately after this course is over. Um, it's not like a regular semester where I have about a week to put things together and I can take some straggling assignments and, and so forth. Summer A doesn't work that way. Um, they want to get geared up for summer B, which is going to happen, you know, almost right away after this session. Um, so there's no time to uh, muck about. Okay. Um, so just keep that in mind because it's going to come up quick by the end of the week. Okay. Having said that, let me go over uh, section 2.2 today, lighting fundamentals. And I want to take this just from a a uh, little bit of an aesthetic uh, point of view and just a three point lighting discussion. Nothing too complex, not like, uh, you know, what I used to do on the, uh, you know, on the union jobs out in Hollywood, but a basic understanding of what your lighting is trying to accomplish and a couple of ideas to get you sort of started and moving in the right direction. Uh, and then I want to show you some fun tools I've been playing with uh, lately, which have, has got me really, um, uh, really kind of enthusiastic again for the lighting game and for what's going on out there in the in the freelance world and uh, you know share some thoughts on that stuff with you um, so let me uh, let's just pop into web courses really quick see what I have set up for you here a uh, little bit of light sort of introductory reading here um, just about basic objectives uh, what we're trying to accomplish here with our uh, lighting Okay, which is in a nutshell, um, cinematic lighting is, uh, it's very deliberate and crafted lighting, all right? It's not available light, it's not ambient light that we just sort of walk in a room and go, oh yeah, this is great, let's shoot with this, okay? 
It's not that kind of situation. It's deliberate, crafted, dramatic lighting that will help reinforce through nonverbal um, uh, conventions the storyline, the message of the film, um, director's intent, and so forth. Okay. So the lighting is taking a very sort of key role, but it's a very, um, if, if you will, no pun intended, a low key role. In other words, it's, it's not meant to call attention to itself as in the words of Roger Deakins, good lighting is lighting that doesn't call attention to itself, that interacts with the audience and engages them in nonverbal ways that they don't realize is happening at all, kind of works on a subconscious level. Okay, that's what our cinematic lighting is doing. Okay. So, but I want to get you started. I want to sort of open this conversation and get you thinking about um, how you want to approach the question of lighting, right? Um, I would use the word problem, but I, and I suppose by definition, that might be an accurate term, but I, I don't like to confuse the issue with a lot of negative connotations. Lighting is not a problem. It's not a liability that you have to deal with. Okay. Lighting is an opportunity for you to add an extra layer of complexity to your storytelling. Okay. In a way that's going to engage your audience, get your message to them and have them receive it in the, with the right intention. Okay. And it's a, it's a very important part of the process. I think that distinguishes cinema from other uh, creative art forms. Okay. Uh, for, for one very simple reason. You can say, but professor, there's lighting in art. There's lighting in photography. Uh, yes, there is. And there's lighting in theater and there's lighting in live performance. Yes, there are all those things. But with maybe the exception of live performance, one of the things that's happening in our cinematic application is our camera's moving, our subjects are moving, sometimes at the same time. Um, and therefore, that adds a layer of complexity to a lighting scheme that you don't necessarily have when you're rendering one frame at a time, whether that's a frame of photo film or of, whether it's a frame uh, on canvas, right, where you have one point of view, one isolated moment in time. We're dealing with real time. We're dealing with actors moving, cameras moving in tandem. Right. And so the lighting takes on a dimensional complexity that has to be thought about um, planned typically ahead of time uh, to make sure you have all the right resources and equipment uh, available to you on the day. Right. You don't want to sort of figure out your lighting schemes on the day uh, for the first time. Sometimes you can do that and it depends on the complexity of the shoot, if it's a very simple, small um, project or, a, or just a quick scene or a few shots, a lot of times you can go in um, with a basic set of tools and sort of determine what you need on the fly. But I like to always plan things out and make sure that um, I have all the resources at my disposal at, at the time that we have to record. Um, and I've thought about a plan. I have a plan sort of in place um, that I'm going to follow through with. I'm going to execute on the day and the plan, I might have come up with the plan the night before, the day before, a week before, months before, it all depends on the size of the shoot. Um, but it's, it's a plan that I can have in place and I can execute it or I can change my mind on the day. But at least I have uh, resources accounted for, time and um, manpower accounted for, um, discussions beforehand with the cinematographer, if I'm the lighting designer, the director, if I'm the cinematographer, uh, we all kind of get together and we have pre-production meetings and we talk about what, what do we want things to look like, right? How do we, what, what tone do we want to elicit for our audience? How do we want to execute that? Or how do we want to reinforce that with performance, camera work and lighting, right? And we talk about those three, those, those three things. Um, as a way of giving our giving ourselves an idea of how we're going to execute this this uh, the question of the story, and, and have it be received by our audience the way that we we want them to receive it. Okay. Um, this can get as complex as you want it to get. Okay. Um, I mean, movies like you know Eagle Eye and Pirates of the Caribbean and and 
you know, too fast and too furious where I had, you know, millions of dollars of assets and, and huge, sometimes multiple crews working uh, around the clock. I mean, it can get to that degree. It can also be as simple as, you know, a quick uh, deposition video or a documentary interview or, um, you know, just a workflow that you kind of design for yourself. Maybe you work alone a lot, so you need lighting solutions that are um, at the same time creative, quick and easy to execute for one person and effective in sort of conveying these unspoken messages, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's a conversation you'll probably be engaged in throughout your career because it never really kind of slows down. Um, even for me now at this point in my career after 30 years uh, in the field, I'm asking myself new questions. Um, what's up with LEDs? Uh, what, you know, what's the, what are the expectations now of conventional lighting? The kind of lighting we used to do 10, 15, 20 years ago, is it still happening and to what extent? How are we integrating the new um, methods and techniques into the lighting? Uh, how is the lighting landscape changing on a technical level, uh, on an execution level, um, and on an education level, even you know, even guys like me, I have to take myself back to school and I have to learn about new systems and, and new ways of doing things, integrating with computers and so forth. Um, and so you'll have this conversation from now and throughout your career. OK, but hopefully today we'll get you started. We'll get you thinking about it and don't take this opportunity for granted in terms of adding a, a facet to your filmmaking capability that will raise the level of your game, raise the quality of your uh, output, uh, and maybe help garner you some of the recognition or attention for your work that you, you know, that you hope will happen um, with your audiences, with your market, with your clients, and so forth, okay? Um, so lighting, in a nutshell, is um, helping us render our subjects with a degree of dimension, texture, shape, that is implied in three dimensions using two-dimensional tools, monitors and cameras and things that render uh, image files in a two-dimensional sort of sense, right? Um, even when we're talking about some of this new stuff like um, Unreal Engine um, and virtual um, rendering and, and tools like that, the output ultimately is two-dimensional space. It's a screen in a theater, right? It has height and width, but it has no, physically, it has no depth for us in the reality of the theater auditorium. But the visuals can imply depth and, and can reveal uh, a depth through lighting, camera work, and lens work um, that enhance that experience for the audience. So, you know, on a very simple level today we're just going to talk about the initial approach how do we even think about it what you know what are we accomplishing three-dimensional uh quality and image traits in two-dimensional recording media okay so um some of that is discussed here uh the rest of it's going to be covered in your reading assignments um, I'm going to put today's discussion like I have been uh, all semester. I'm going to put it right, you know, right under these two pre-recorded videos for you, so you can access this conversation and the other two full-length lectures um, to study from to further the um, uh, conversation for you at your leisure. Watch those videos, um, and then I have some resources uh, online on my YouTube account that you guys have access to. Uh, that take the conversation even further, right? Some some lighting um, demonstrations that I did uh, over uh, at the old uh, full sale recording studios before they updated and upgraded uh, their facility. So there's a lot of material that you can access if you want to, if you have the time and the inclination. Um, and I'll put today's conversation right here for you. Um, your uh, videos, the the important ones from the lecture uh, are also posted here like normal. He, here are the four um, extended conversations, the lighting demonstration that I did. And the unique thing about this conversation that is kind of the next phase of what we'll talk about today is how to apply the concepts we're, we're, we're discussing today uh, specifically to hard light, 
uh, soft light, modified light, um, using soft boxes and so forth. Um, alternative forms of illumination like photofluorescence, corrected photofluorescence called Kino flows. Uh, there's an, a sort of a introductory conversation about light panels. Um, and then I'm going to show you this lighting simulator software, which I think is a lot of fun and I think you'll enjoy using it. Um, it's both educational, uh, offers you a good uh, way to experiment and doesn't require you to go check out a bunch of gear from UCF. You can do it on your laptop or your, I don't know if you could really do it effectively on your phone because the analysis uh, that you have in a screen this small is, is pretty, uh, leaves a lot to be desired. I think, I think the virtual lighting software works best in either on a tablet um, or on a laptop screen or bigger if you have that available to you. So you can see the results and you can evaluate detail at a small level that you might not be able to see on your phone. But I do believe the app does work on your phone. So, um, you know, if that's the only uh, access you have, um, then I think uh, it will work uh, on that as well. Um, your uh, downloadable PDFs. Okay, so the deck that's listed here in your downloadable PDFs is referencing back to the full length uh, recorded lecture. Uh, today, obviously, we're only going to go for maybe an hour and a half. So um, this is a sort of um, condensed conversation, if you will. Um, also, there's uh, um, a uh, this is a relatively advanced conversation about three point lighting uh, that I did for Video Maker. Uh, I think that one came out in 2016. 16 last quarter um, from the point of view of classical lighting using Rembrandt as a reference and, and, and accessing a lot of his images. Um, there are also a couple of other uh, articles for you to look at for attributes of light talking about shape, uh, texture, color and quality like hardness or softness. Um, this is a good way to uh, start thinking about lighting as well in the in the four uh, basic traits that lighting uh, can demonstrate. Um, how to see light is sort of a conversation about, you know, starting to think about, um, you know, recognizing uh, opportunities for dramatic lighting maybe in uh, pre-existing environments. So you walk into a location that you want to shoot at and you see that you have basically some good stuff going on, but maybe you need more volume. Uh, so you want to supplement existing dynamics with supplemental lighting that will just increase the volume uh, for camera or you have a few basic things going right in a location and you want to preserve those couple things that you don't like happening that you're going to remedy with uh, tools or uh, access to um, uh, circuits and systems uh, at a location uh, switches and breakers for instance where you can control what comes on and what what does what stays off um, that kind of conversation and then there's um the basic airy um, uh, lighting booklet that used to come with their uh, their airy uh, lighting kits, uh, I've included that in there for you to look at if you want to kind of just sort of chuckle at what things used to look like 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, and then there's another copy of the Set Lighting Technician's Handbook, and I believe I've given you a reading assignment from that volume. Uh, if I just sort of move this around real quick, I can. There we go. Uh, see what your reading assignment is here that I've given you um, the PDFs and uh, oh, I've just given you the whole book, I guess, to look at in general. There's no real basic conversation about three point lighting in the set lighting technicians handbook. This is more of a this is more like a manual sort of like that. Um, uh, cinematographer's manual. This is more like a volume that you might have with you in your gear bag if you need to um, just reference uh, cabling systems or um, how to, you know, how to level a generator or how to rig a, an aerial platform, things of that nature. It's more of a um, technical um, volume that will assist you in the day-to-day -day workflow that you're engaged in and not necessarily um, describing what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. For that, you might want to look at the uh, the Brown Book volume, is it three, I think, um, with the blue cover that I have on your bookshelf. 
uh, or there's some nice um, material to maybe follow up with in the uh, introductory to cinematography volume by uh, Hozier, the required text for this course. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, the assignment, which is going to hinge on the um, application I'm going to show you today. I'll show you how to access it online. I'll show you how the basic uh, tools work. Uh, and then there's just a little bit of um, information here about how to execute the assignment. Okay. Um, so that's web courses. Uh, what I'll do now is jump over to my uh, keynote presentation and um, move you uh, through that material now. There we go. Um, basic lighting. Okay, this is a composite image. This is actually uh, both digital and um, a piece of an actual film frame from one of the uh, Mission Impossible films. Oh no, I'm sorry, Minor Minority Report. Um, but I like it as a, um, you know, just a uh, sort of title card for what we're gonna discuss today. Uh, three point lighting. We'll do a little bit of an intro, which I think we're kind of already engaged in. I want to talk to you about um, examples and wisdom derived from classic art. In other words, um, the photographic medium, the the idea of using photosensitive uh, devices and materials is a relatively, relatively speaking, a new technology. Now, we've been doing it for a little over 100 years, and it has evolved from its very rudimentary beginnings and in a photochemical process to this digital thing that we're doing now. Uh, but in the scheme of things, I mean, when we're talking about classical art, the uh, examples that maybe were created four or five, even 600 years ago. Photography and photographic processes are relatively new in that regard. So I want to just take a look back at a few examples of classic art and give you an idea of where some of our inspiration comes from, uh, some of our motivation for lighting placement and um, the thought process that goes through a modern uh, lighting designer's head while executing these types of things either live or for camera um, based on um, stimulus and inspiration from other media. And really uh, the painting classical art media, I think is largely responsible for um, the fundamental approach that we take to our lighting in, uh, in a cinematic way um, in terms of eliciting drama and um, revealing color texture and tone. Right. So we'll look at that a little bit. I want to define for you the components of a three point lighting setup uh, and help you understand what each of those lights is trying to achieve um, in the it, in the notion of creating three dimensional imagery in 2D space. Um, and then uh, and then I'll show you the lighting simulator. So maybe this will be a quick conversation today. Uh, it can be as long as you want. I've had this lecture go for three hours plus an hour of Q&A after that. Um, we don't really have that kind of time, I think, in the Zoom sessions. So that might be a reason for you to check out the, the longer video lecture. Um, certainly, it's the motivation for you to follow up on your reading assignments. And then, I, as always, I'm available uh, you know, through web courses email uh, with your questions and concerns, OK? so. Um, with that, having said that, uh, let's get into it. So nonverbal communication, um, and this is from the Brown book. One of the most important tools that we can employ uh, as filmmakers is visual metaphor. Images that represent ideas that are um, either counterintuitive to the messaging of our film or that support the messaging of our film in ways that are not um, simply spoken directly to the audience and revealed in um, uh, sort of expository ways, right? Um, lighting is subtle. Lighting is subconscious. Lighting is um, happening sort of in tandem with performance and with dialogue. Um, but it is supporting the ideas of your story in ways that um, can run kind of under the radar sometimes. And uh, especially when you have um, spectacle, you know, demonstrative action, 
big sets, you know, confusing or complex backgrounds and um, complicated dialogue and actors that are, you know, doing, you know, complex and amazing things that are sort of occupying our conscious uh, brains and entertaining us in those ways. The lighting's kind of working underneath, going on all the time and, and sort of reinforcing everything that you're looking at, but in ways that hopefully uh, doesn't keep you from processing the other things you're being exposed to, but rather reinforces those ideas in a way that helps, you know, helps you take it all in um, without uh, um, upsetting your, uh, your situation or your suspension of disbelief, right? It allows you to enjoy a film and get all of the feeling and emotion and intent from the story that uh, the filmmakers wanted you to, to receive, um, but without having to think too much about it as, as an audience participant. Um, so good lighting is gonna communicate in a lot of ways. It's not gonna call attention to itself, but it's going to require that you um, uh, do your research, uh, practice uh, the craft, uh, keep yourself up to date on uh, materials and processes and so forth uh, so that you have these, um, uh, these skills and benefits at your immediate disposal, right? Um, shape, form, and texture. So uh, the idea that lighting comes from the same point of view of the camera or the lens in the camera um, is one of the uh, situations that we try to avoid uh, when we're offering dramatic lighting. For instance, my key light is is off to this side, right? Uh, I have a uh, Cinemills um, two by two by color LED working here uh, with barn doors and a soft uh, egg crate to sort of help focus the light uh, and, and take it in a sort of an, an off axis uh, direction that starts to uh, create this, we call it a wrappy situation where the light starts from a highlight on one side and sort of transitions on a three-dimensional object revealing shape and texture into a shadow uh, situation and then i took another uh, smaller uh, led uh, they call them cob lights now um, and uh, i took a snoot and and just sort of projected it on the background to create sort of this contrast between the shadow end of my uh, bookshelf and some detail in the background that sort of creates an environment uh, for me. I probably uh, should have turned this uh, lamp off in the back corner to help, uh, you know, give this a little bit more dramatic um, uh, shape, but uh, I sort of forgot to do that. <laughs> um, but anyway, everything is sort of planned out, right? The, the angle of this light has been predetermined. The addition of this light's been predetermined. The decision to leave on or turn off a light like this available lamp is, is also part of the consideration. Um, and then things like contrasting value, uh, detail in the shadows or no detail in the shadows. Do we want that? Do we not want that? Does it help the story or not, right? Um, if it's a certain kind of a film, like if it's a horror film, right? Uh, detail on the background sometimes can be competitive with performance happening here in the foreground, like oh my God, I'm afraid the monster's gonna get me or whatever it is that's going on. Maybe we want our environments to be a little bit more, uh, a little darker uh, and able to conceal the threats and therefore reinforce psychologically the fear in our audience because sometimes what you can't see can hurt you if it's uh, Leatherface <laughs> with a chainsaw, for instance. Um, so these are all things that we like to talk about and reason out in pre-production with directors and cinematographers and lighting designers and, and uh, use all these tools uh, to our maximum benefit, right? Uh, we want to try and reveal texture. We want to um, infer the geometric shape uh, or form of our subjects and objects uh, in our films. Um, and we want this sort of three-dimensional presence to emerge on the screen and give us a sense of uh, environments and, and how our, our subjects and objects are moving within it. Um, uh, while defining the depth of a shot, it's also important to establish the mood or the tone, right? So really bright lighting is good for comedy, right? Where people are running around, maybe they are, um, maybe they are uh, working um, 
spontaneously and therefore there's no real way to sort of determine if an actor is going to stand over there or over here and therefore the lighting has to be sort of bright and broad so that whatever happens in the course of a shot or a scene uh, the lighting will be ample for exposure and revealing performance for the audience or maybe we're talking about that horror movie maybe we're talking about jessica beale hiding in the uh, lockers uh, at the meatpacking plant and Leatherface is a few feet away uh, with a chainsaw ready to hack her to bits if he can find out which locker she's hiding in. You know, do we want that to be a bright, broadly lit situation? Probably not. Psychologically speaking, uh, when you want to scare the crap out of people, generally you show them less detail, not more detail. Um, because everything that we leave to the psychological aspects of our audience, in other words, the subconscious, um, we tend to, if we're going to a horror movie, our subconscious is going to help us right away by injecting all of our fear and our anxieties into the images that we're looking at. And if we show too much detail, we can quell or calm that anxiety. And we don't want to do that. We want to ratchet it up, right? So some of the things that are the most scariest are the things that are hiding in the shadows, waiting to jump out at us, right? So we use shadows to our advantage in a movie like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003, right? Uh, and I think um, it was, um, I think it was John Carpenter who famously said, um, the psychology of the mind and our imaginations can scare an audience more through what we think we see than anything I could ever show them on the screen, right? So what he's saying is sometimes uh, what we choose not to light is as important or maybe more important than the things that we would seek to, to light, right? So sometimes lighting the subject is necessary to see who we're dealing with and basically, you know, what their situation is, you know, what, what they're talking about, what they're wearing and basically where they are. And then other times it's more important to show less of what's going on so that the mind of the audience can sort of work with us as the filmmakers to scare themselves as much as we're scaring them with the images we create, right? Uh, their subconscious becomes sort of our partner in the storytelling um, unwittingly or unbeknownst to the audience. So this is the process. This is what we're thinking about when we, when we deal with lighting uh, in these, these forms. Now, I have a quick little clip here uh, that I want to show you. It's called... Um, sparkles and wine i think it's uh, i pulled it off of uh, youtube um and what's neat about it is it's this situation where we have um a subject that has been sort of situated in the center of frame we have a camera that's locked off and what they're doing is they're moving lights around this subject in time lapse and showing you from the point of view of position uh in space xyz so height and you know, foreground, background, left and right, and then they're using color and color changes. And as the light moves around the subject, you can kind of see how the shadows change, how the, the tone might change. Um, and it's an interesting visual um, exercise to get you thinking about positioning of lighting and, and the idea that, you know, a light coming from the front has an implication and a light coming from behind a subject has a different implication. And sometimes those implications are positive, sometimes they're negative, sometimes they infer um, uh, awareness, um, daytime consciousness or subconsciousness uh, coming from behind, fear, um, nighttime. Um, and this is all part of your decision process as much as making the walls red, white, or blue, right? Um, it's just it's just another thing that you can think about as a filmmaker that will add the complexity to your stories that we're after, right? Because these are the things that are going to differentiate your work from somebody else's, right? The degree to which you manipulate all of these these variables, right? So take a look at this really quick. It's only like a two minutes, I think. And um, in fact, I'll go full screen, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about it uh, when it's over. Okay. So here is uh, Sparkles and Wine.
I like the uh, <laughs> I like the techno beat. So uh, I took a uh, <laughs> the opportunity to uh, uh, to turn that light oh turn that light off uh, while you guys are watching the video, and also to sort of uh, dim down my key light a little bit. I noticed it was a little hot. Uh, on my forehead and uh, you know I have graying hair that's very aggressively <laughs> thinning and turning white uh, with every <laughs> passing week month and year <laughs> and uh, so uh, I wanted to tone down my key light a little bit um, but that's uh, that sparkles and wine it's a it's a neat little um, uh, just sort of expose um, done in time lapse so it's obviously you know they move the light they do they record a few frames they move the light again record a few frames and they move around the subject sort of in a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion uh and show you you know sometimes the light coming from above has different appeal and meaning to light coming from below or from the side or from the front or from the back um, and, and we have to sort of make these choices on a day to day basis on set, you know, with our lighting, especially if we're working on a sound stage where we're starting in basically a dark black box. Uh, and we have to bring everything in to illuminate the world that we're recording um, from our imagination and um, and therefore it pays to pay attention to the visual world uh, in our realities. Uh, to give us, to inform us about how light works. Um, like just if you're, you know, sitting in your living room in the late afternoon with all the artificial lighting in your house turned off and you're just looking at how window comes through, uh, lighting comes through windows. You know, how does the sun look when it comes through my, uh, my living room window in late afternoon? How does, uh, how does the sun look? I used to get in trouble all the time with my, with my ex because uh, we'd be at a restaurant or usually on Sundays, we'd go to this really neat uh, restaurant in, in uh, Hollywood called Little Doms and have breakfast and coffee. And they had these wonderful old booths with Baroque wooden carving and marble tables and slab marble bar with brass and glass and everything and stained stained glass windows. And, and uh, I used to love going to that place. Uh, not only was the food good <laughs> and the coffee was great, but just sitting in that environment for a person like me, a lighting person, a camera person, the stimuli that I got from being in a place like that would just transport me. And I would think about all the things that, you know, how would I recreate that environment on stage where the walls are black and there's nothing there until the art department gives me a set and the lighting designer decorates it and the cinematographer or the director defines the tone and the mood for me. And then how am I going to make interior coffee shop on Sunday afternoon on a soundstage in Culver City, right? When I'm sitting in Hillhurst on a Sunday with my, uh, with my girlfriend and we're enjoying a, a meal and a cup of coffee, you know, how do I translate my realities into my onstage craft work that I do for clients, right? And so that's kind of, if you have those <laughs> sorts of issues going on, uh, you might be a lighting designer, you might be a cinematographer, because those those things become paramount to your awareness and to your creative expression, right? Um, lighting doesn't just simply happen if you're a cinematographer, it's created and it's created specifically for a situation. Um, so where do we get this inspiration from? Well, one of the guys who is often credited with uh, the fundamental modern sensibility about lighting is this guy right here. And you've probably seen him before, Rembrandt, okay? The artist, uh, circa 17th century, right? Um, this guy had a way of rendering with oil and uh, canvas. Um, the, the realities that he witnessed on a daily basis, uh, whether it was a self-portrait or an environmental portrait, somebody in a scene, uh, you know, he lived in um, Holland, Amsterdam. So, um, you know, he was definitely stimulated by his environment um, and he did his best to um, capture those feelings, those um, tableaus, if you will. Uh, for posterity with his oils and brushes and canvas, right? So this guy uh, had a way of thinking about light and how it applies itself to subjects in space, whether in interior environments or exterior environments. And he did a lot of work that explored that whole 
situation. Um, this is a self-portrait that he did of himself in 1636 when he was about, uh, I think he was 32 or 33 at the time he did this portrait. Um, and you'll notice that uh, it's very similar kind of, isn't it, to the lighting that I've, I've applied to myself here just for this Zoom conversation. So there's a key light happening off to one side, but not, you know, not from the point of view of the camera, if you will, but somewhere over in the room, if you will, a lamp, a chandelier, a window, maybe. This sort of key light that I'm using here, as basic as it is, um, is sort of insinuating something. It's insinuating that maybe there's a window over here. I mean, unless I pan my camera over and show you <laughs> my dining room, you know, uh, you don't know, there might be a window here. And if I've put this light in just the right place and I've given it just the right quality, softness and diffusion and everything, you might very well make the assumption that there's a window there and that it's not an artificial light. And that's, that's the whole point, right? So, Interestingly, uh, this guy in the 1600s had a way of thinking about light and how it hits the subject and so forth without the added advantage or benefits of cameras and film and, and stuff like that, books and magazines that, that had you know, illustrations. Uh, this guy had to do it with powers of observation, um, you know, very effective um, use of his vision to look at and analyze um, and then break down mentally the, the logic of something like a chandelier and, and how it looks when it hits somebody and then be able to render it uh, with oil and brush, right? Um, which is another layer of complexity, um, you know, in and of itself. Uh, we do it with tools, lights and so forth and cameras and he did it with brushes and paint, so. Um, in his earlier uh, developmental period, uh, so 1609, right? Um, he must have been older in 1636 uh, than 32 years old because if he did this in 1609, 22 years earlier, uh, I think he was about 18 when he did this. So that would make him what? About uh, 40 here, not 30, 40, okay? Um, but look at look at how he saw himself uh, in his youth, more contrasty, uh, half-lit, uh, whereas here uh, his light source is kind of coming around and, and give us an, a little bit of what we call the low, the low side eye, right? Uh, the, the eye that is uh, sort of buried in shadow. And there's a, there's a transition happening here from highlight to shadow that's very sort of soft and understated. Uh, and in his youthful self-portrait, the transition line is, is harder, more contrasty, right? And so, you know, this demonstrates an, sort of an evolution in his own thought process as demonstrated through his own self-portrait work, um, how, he, how he saw himself and how he imagined light would play in the environment and on himself uh, when he looked, for instance, in the mirror and started painting. Um, and you can see this process uh, throughout his career. Uh, he has a number of self-portraits. If you get a book on Rembrandt, for instance, I have a number of them that I, that I often look at um, just for information and inspiration. And uh, you can see he, di he did several uh, self-portraits over the years, looking at how light plays on skin when it's tight and youthful or when it's old and wrinkled and, and the color of his lighting, right? This lighting is a little bit more neutral uh, and this lighting is much warmer, right? So what was the idea there? Was this daylight coming through a window uh, or through an open vestibule doorway maybe? Was this a chandelier or a candelabra that was lighting him? Um, we don't know those specifics necessarily. Um, uh, we have a certain amount of information available to us about his studio and the way he used to work. But for the most part, I mean, these are choices that were made uh, through his imagination and how he saw himself, a little bit of his psychological, you know. Um, he was one of the first people to uh, execute something uh, called chiaroscuro, which is an Italian word. I think it was first coined by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, chiaroscuro, the deliberate interplay of highlight and shadow, and how much of it do we incorporate it in our work? Um, and the extent that contrast plays a key role in the tone and the uh, message that our images convey. 
um, and Rembrandt, Caravaggio were two contemporaries that were, you know, heavily uh, using this technique. Here's a here's a uh, Caravaggio from 1601. Uh, this is uh, called Doubting Thomas or Saint Thomas, and it is a it's a historical or a legendary rendering, if you will, depending on your point of view, um, of the scene involving the resurrected Christ and his appearance, subsequent appearance to his disciples after he was crucified. And doubting Thomas, if you will, is inspecting the, uh, the wound sustained by Christ while he was hanging on the cross, the, uh, uh, the centurion who pierced his side with the spear to accelerate his suffocation process while hanging on the cross. Um, this is a uh, arguably a historical rendering um, and he's doing it with all the shadow and drama um, that I think Caravaggio felt was appropriate for the topic, right? Um, the, the idea that uh, did this really happen to this guy? Did it happen in this way? And if it did, how would his friends react to it? Would they just say, hey, you're back, how great? Or what do you mean? We saw you expire. We saw you die in a situation and we put you in a in a mausoleum and now you're back and you're crashing our party and what's up with that you know and so i think this is like a really ancient example of what you know we might uh in in modern um uh, filmmaking consider a um a a stylized drama um you know maybe a horror movie or whatever you know uh, and he's using texture and tone and shadows to create very deliberate mood, right? Um, and this was at the the core of what Leonardo explored kind of throughout his entire career. He was very famous for uh, doing a lot of research and sketching of um, things, do a lot of illustration of his ideas uh, that he would keep in notebooks. And he would consult these notebooks um, ad nauseum to uh, it was his version of, I think, um, pre-production and scouting, you know, to go out and, and sketch things in a landscape or uh, go visit the museum and look at a sculpture at different times of day and see how the sun as it tracks across the sky uh, might apply itself to a marble or alabaster statue and then record that information in the form of sketches and illustrations that would inform him later. Uh, when he's painting a similar idea, I go back and look at his notes and say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, in late afternoon uh, in uh, in Milan, when I went to see this statue of whatever, um, the light was kind of hitting the statue in a certain way, and it created this sort of tone or this feeling that um, I want to recapture that here in the subject that I'm painting now, but he'll look at his sketchbooks and, re and refer to those notes uh, to help with you know, with whatever project he had going on. And so you can see the things that he was looking at and studying. Transitions from highlight and shadow. Are they soft? Are they hard? Um, highlight versus shadow. How much highlight? How much shadow? Right? Does shadow inform shape and texture? Yes, it does. How so? By the position of the light, right? Does it hit from the from directly in front of the subject from the point of view of our eyes or our camera? Or does it does it rake across the surface of a, of a uh, situation or a subject from the side, therefore revealing uh, relief, revealing texture uh, in these surfaces? Um, what's the angle? Is it from above? Is it from below? Is it from the side? Is it from the back, right? These dynamics um, all have, you know, ramifications on our lighting uh, in real time sometimes. If we analyze uh, these classic images, so this is uh, Supper at Emma's from Caravaggio, uh, we can start making assumptions about the direction and, um, and tonality of his uh, apparent light sources, right? So the, the lighting is coming from the side or slightly behind the, uh, the central character uh, or characters, if you will. Um, it's above eye level, above head height. So it's coming down at a steep angle from the side or three quarters from behind. Um, and when it does so, when it takes that angle of execution, the resulting shadows and texture on our subject is very um, distinct, right? So you can tell here, he, here this central character uh, is side lit, uh, very little return off of the tunic of the uh, innkeeper, uh, filling, if you will, the shadow side of this uh, 
uh, patron to to the inn. Uh, his uh, his companions uh, seated around the table with him. This guy is sort of looking perpendicular to camera or looking across the frame at our subject and therefore uh, the way the light applies to him is more it would be more direct if we were standing over his shoulder but because we are coming from this position right 90 degrees off axis to this the way this man is seated he also has the appearance of being side lit although he's getting hit more full in the face than the character looking directly at the camera Right. And the same with the innkeeper and the innkeeper's wife. They're kind of getting hit with side light as well, based on their orientation within the frame. And then this guy who's seated in the foreground uh, with his back turned to the camera, uh, we don't see much definition at all on his camera side or his low side. Uh, just a little bit of edging that happens from a source that's coming from behind him. So this is a really good uh, illustration. We have four different sort of situations happening all at the same time and you know four different characters five different characters within the scene uh, each getting hit by lighting um, in different ways based on how they're turned away from or toward camera and turned away from or toward their light source right so um, if you, if you can start thinking about uh, lighting in those terms right if you can start thinking about how lighting is happening how it's mapping itself or applying itself to our subjects um, and, and then learn to deconstruct that process uh, in your own work and think about, you know, this is going to inform where do I want to put a light source? Do I want to put it back here in the corner of the room? Do I want to put it close to camera? Do I want to put it off to the side of my subjects? And when I do that, how does that make me feel about these characters? Do I feel good about them? Do I feel worried for them, afraid of them? Um, what's the implication, right? This is very deliberate. This is the process. Um, here's another example. This is uh, um, Vermeer, one of my favorites. Um, Vermeer's classic style incorporated a lot of window light uh, in his renderings. Um, and window light has a softness uh, about it. It has a uh, feeling that can be um, uh, elicited, um, which is kind of soft, low in contrast, uh, what we call rappy. You know, notice how the shadows uh, on the, uh, the milkmaid are defined, but not as deep as the shadows in uh, the depiction of St. Thomas, right? So we have couple of different feelings here all at once. We have low contrast, um, not sort of non-directional lighting. It's coming from a window, but by virtue of its diffusion, um, we don't get a sense of the hard directionality that we get from maybe a single candle source in the case of this, this dark room where uh, Jesus uh, reveals himself to his disciples, right? So a couple of different, and plus this is a very warm image, right? Uh, suggesting candles or um, whatever contemporary <laughs> technology light source they were using, torches, candles, really, it's a very oil lamps, maybe it's a fairly limited selection of, um, of Lumieres at, at that point in history. Um, and then this has a more neutral tone to it, sort of suggesting that the, the, the non-directional uh, daylight coming through the window is lighting the scene with a more um, white, if you will, neutral tone uh, or quality to the lighting. Um, and, and these are things to consider, right? Because we can use uh, light sources now, uh, which possess these characteristics, either the warm uh, tones of incandescent lighting, for instance, that we would get from our conventional studio sources. I think I've got got a couple sitting around here. Um, here's a very small example of a uh, conventional source. This is a um, 100, 150 watt uh, focusable Fresnel, um, Airy or Cinemills um, conventional fixer using incandescent um, uh, bulbs. Uh, in fact, if I sort of open this up, you can see the the bulb carriage inside. 
and the type of oh i got it <laughs> i actually put a little um led cob in here so it's not an incandescent bulb at all it's actually a an updated led uh bulb in an incandescent uh, conventional socket um so oops you know <laughs> that's fun but um uh you can contrast that for instance with uh a an led source this is uh from uh Dracast. this is a uh, uh an led fresnel you can sort of see the emitter inside there it's a uh, surface mount um what they call a cob a circuit on board uh, led source um by color so it's warm or cool in nature depending on how i dial those values in on the control panel on the back of the light you can see sort of dimming and color quality values there um, and so these are the types of things that are going on with our lighting and we can we can choose all of these things um, as conditions through which we render our images okay um, here's another one by Vermeer. This is the girl with a pearl earring, and you, you probably heard of this, if not seen it. It was the subject of a feature film and a documentary at one point. Um, this is a classic, sort of a famous or infamous image now, the girl with a pearl earring. Um, and it incorporates a lot of things. I'm going to talk about this image again um, on Thursday when we talk about um, composition and, and visual design, uh, because there are some very deliberate um, compositional uh, rules taking place here. Um, but in terms of the lighting, just the lighting itself, if you look at the, the softness and the broadness of this light, the background behind the subject is very dark. It's kind of like, you know, I made choices back here. Do I want light to happen or don't I? Uh, and to what extent? Well, in this case, uh, Vermeer was painting the object of his desire, right? So he didn't want the audience to think about anything from the environment. He, he wanted the audience to understand why, as a successful artist and married family man, this guy would have a fixation on this beautiful young woman. And the reason was, he said, look, I'm not going to show you anything but her raw physical beauty uh, as rendered by the window light in my studio and my own uh, visual acuity and my uh, and my um, uh, my effective use of my tools, my paints and my brushes, soft, delicate transition lines from highlight to shadow, broad highlight blanketing the subject in a soft, low contrast light. Um, the suggestion of, you know, an eye light or a twinkle in the eye, which would indicate youthful vitality. Um, and then the use of color, right, in the textiles and in the makeup. Um, and then this particular um, shiny bauble, um, which is a focal point, the, the actual earring itself. Um, and then all of the arrangement of all these elements within the frame, right? Um, this is a very complex um, visual that's going on uh, with a very simple idea. And that idea is passion, right? The, the the love and the and the focus that this person had on this individual and it's sort of a um it's a um what would you say it's a reverent image right it's a very reverent image uh along the same lines we've got this fellow metsu gabriel metsu in the mid 1600s using similar techniques uh, that Vermeer is using, window light as a light source. And he's sort of combining the notions of daylight window quality to uh, torch lit interior lighting quality. And he's combining both of those things uh, in the same image. So we got warm, it's probably early morning light. This is called woman in her toilet. Um, and uh, for the upper classes in, in this time period, the toilet was a room that uh, a woman might spend the majority of her time because she was either getting in or getting out of some kind of complex um, wardrobe situation and doing makeup and, and getting ready to present herself to society at a party, at a dinner engagement. Um, and so the toilet room was really um, an environment that you know would have possessed certain qualities right and so this young woman is being attended to by her uh governess or her well not her governess but her um her handmaiden uh, uh if you will um and because of the warm quality of the lighting it suggests that it's probably fairly early in the morning uh if you look at 
early morning sunlight versus afternoon sunlight versus um, early evening sunlight, you'll see that sunlight possesses different color and contrast qualities, uh, depending on the time of day that you witness the, the sunlight uh, and the subjects that are being illuminated by it. And this attention to the realities, this attention to the detail and the ability to recall it and render it uh, is, it's sort of alluding to the, the extent of the dedication and talent that these folks had uh, in creating their art. Uh, if we want to take purely analytical approaches to these uh, evidential eventualities, the, the evidence in these images, uh, here is uh, a portion of a tableau. Uh, this is a much larger um, uh, vignette by uh, Guido uh, Cagnacci uh, with devils and angels and all kinds of things happening within the frame. Uh, but in the lower kind of right corner of the, um, of the tableau is this situation here. Um, and it's called Martha rebuking Mary. And if we, if we start thinking about our lighting conventions, what does shadow mean? What does directionality insinuate uh, or infer? Um, what assumptions can we make about the visual that we see before us? Okay, so here's Martha rebuking Mary. And you can, through, um, through the evidence, you can make certain assumptions. You can assume that the girl on the right is Martha because of the posturing, the wagging of the finger, if you will, uh, and the fact that she is slightly higher in the frame than Mary. And, and Mary is the source of the rebuke and the rebuke uh, uh, is uh, the scolding of, right? So if you're rebuking somebody, you're scolding them, presumably for doing something wrong or, or against the norms of, basic family rule or rule of society. Um, and so what did Mary do that, you know, deserved the scorn of her presumably older sister because the two don't look terribly different in age. Um, so you can make some assumptions. Maybe Mary did something very untoward or, um, you know, um, unconventional. Maybe, uh, maybe she, you know, got caught uh, sneaking out of the house late at night to go see her boyfriend and who knows, you know, whatever it is, we can start thinking about the situation. One person is scolding the other, how so? And what's the feeling? What's the tone of the situation? Well, Ma uh, Martha is kind of blanketed and bathed in the light, the, 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 the light of the righteous, right? She's fully lit in her face. Uh, she has a delicate transition line going. She has a highlight over her forehead, nose. Uh, she's got a little bit of a raccoon eye thing going on here uh, because of the contrast of the light itself. But it's kind of a warm light that's sort of bathing her directly, right? With the light of knowledge or, or righteousness. She's scolding somebody else, so she is the righteous one, right? And uh, Mary... Uh, has her face turned away from the light and, and the psychological implication of somebody that has done wrong or somebody who has gone down a path of ill repute would be that they have turned away from the light. So in this case, um, Mary has done something that has taken her away from the norms, uh, the accepted norms of society. She's done something wrong. And so she is turned away from the light and her face, her eyes, her brains are in shadow. So she is, has been deceived or has deceived someone, has done something wrong and she has, um, she has warranted the, the rebuke of her, of her older sister, right? And you can get all that messaging just from the quality and, and context of the lighting. So if we apply those same analytical principles, we can look at something like The Mocking of Christ by Matthias Stomer from 1633. This is another um, uh, religious theme. Uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, 15, 16, 1700s, there wasn't a lot else to talk about. Um, we had war and we had religion, right? We had famine and we had disease. So um, those were the predominant uh, subjects of the time. Uh, you know, religious 
uh, iconography being a very popular theme for classic art. So we have the um, the Christ figure uh, right after being um, subjugated and um, and uh, what um, arraigned, if you will, by Pontius Pilate. He see that his hands are bound. Uh, he has the crown of thorns, uh, demonstrating that he was um, mocked and um, uh, put on display by the uh, members of the court. Uh, he has a, sul a sullen look on his face, the indication of somebody who is uh, experiencing uh, a great uh, suffering. Um, and then we have, he's surrounded by the individuals who are attempting to process what has happened, to um, try to encourage uh, the, the Christ character from his um, despondency. And then we have individuals who are trying to influence his behavior, like, uh, why are you making these claims of, of um, deified capability or, um, you know these these claims of um, of um, uh, of moral superiority. Uh, why don't you just tell him what he wants to hear so you can get off uh, free and be um, you know uh, um, uh, cleared of all of these trumped up charges? And so we have all of these sort of things going on within a frame, uh, which is very dramatic. It's dramatically lit, and it's sort of purposely lit. Um, with this, uh, um, uh, it's it's a pretty bright candle. It's got two distinct flames. It's probably a double wick tallow candle. Um, it's burning very brightly, but it is a small spectral source, so it creates deep shadows and contrast. Uh, and it's the only light source in this situation. So you can kind of see as these these people are all sort of situated around the candle flame, depending on their position. Uh, relative to the camera, if you will, uh, the candle flame is applying itself to each of these individuals in different ways. So we have the fully broadly lit Christ who is slightly behind and very close to the light source. Uh, we have this individual kind of over his shoulder, which is masked a little bit by the garment and therefore shadowed in some way, and also a, a greater distance away, therefore not as brightly lit. Uh, as our immediate subjects in the frame. Uh, we have another individual who is clearly uh, mostly behind the candle and therefore very broadly lit, almost frontally lit. Uh, but because of the size uh, and contrast of the source, there is a resulting contrast on his face that is harder, if you will, uh, than window light or reflected light might be. Deeper shadows, darker shadows with less detail present. And, th and these guys also uh, side lit um, and their, uh, their near sides are fully in shadow and there's virtually no detail to discern in those areas. And the detail emerges as we transition from the shadow to the highlight, right? So this is a really interesting figure study uh, for a lot of reasons and not the least of which is because it sort of, uh, it speaks to a certain principle in photography that um, we have come to know uh, to know as uh, illuminance or foot candle illuminance, right? So we have a single source in the frame, this candle flame, which is very small and therefore very contrasty. Um, and it shows, uh, it renders light in very distinct ways uh, and is the fundamental basis for what we call the foot candle uh, in cinematography or photography, which is the fundamental unit of distinction uh, used by our light meters to help us figure out how much light is coming out of a light source and how to set the cinema camera, specifically the lens on the cinema camera, to uh, accommodate the illumination, to balance the exposure and give us an image that's not too bright and not too dark. So I love this uh, image for so many ways. It's It speaks to the um, the, the, the creative aspects of the lighting. It speaks to tonality, texture, and form. It speaks to the qualities of, of light, hardness, softness, contrast, and color. And it also uses a fundamental principle that uh, we still incorporate today uh, by virtue of our light meter. So this, this image 
uh, has so much going on beneath the surface uh, that when I saw it for the first time, I realized I had to use it in my lectures because uh, um, you could have a conversation, you know, I could take a lighting conversation for a couple of hours just based on what's going on here. So um, this is a really sort of a, a key image, I think, um, in the lexicon of uh, classic lighting uh, from art or uh, photography. Um, it's just a shot of my light meter to, you know, just showing you uh, what kind of information is present in the, in the liquid crystal on this thing. So uh, you dial in the um, recommended ISO, uh, the native ISO, if you will, that we talked about in the exposure uh, portion of our semester. You dial in your frame rate and then you present the light meter to your light source, turn it on, and there's a little sort of measurement uh, execution button there. Uh, and I just sort of, from the position of my subject, I point my lumosphere at the source and it tells me in f-stop terms, uh, what value to dial onto my cinema lens on my aperture uh, control uh, wheel uh, to balance my exposure. And all the information is there, 24 frames per second, uh, five, six and a half at ISO 800, right? So if I was shooting with my Ursa Mini Pro, um, this is how I would set the camera in order to make uh, the image of my, my face against my background come out properly balanced, not too bright, not too dark, right? Um, and that's, that's the process. Um, so let's take a look now at, uh, I'm gonna show you some classic uh, images, uh, some oil on canvas, for instance, and then I'm gonna show you or talk to you about similarities present in contemporary works um, and see if we can get a little um, sort of thought process or conversation going here. So here is the Man in Armor. This is by uh, Van Bylert, uh, 1630. And what I think is interesting about this particular piece is the degree of complexity and the accuracy with which this artist using oil and brushes and canvas could render uh, fine detail in the, in the filigree of the armor uh, combined with the resulting highlights that come from uh, an artificial light source reflecting in the surface of this guy's suit in his armor, right? Uh, and the notion that this, this artist could visualize and then process or understand um, what's happening and then copy it onto the canvas like that to me is extraordinary. Um, we do the same thing with our camera, but you know, we don't have to mix our paints and we don't have to, you know, do things of that nature, but we do have to pick our sensors. We do have to choose our lenses. We do have to craft our lighting. So in a lot of ways we're working just as hard, uh, but I think the added complexity of these guys not having the benefit of a camera or film or even a digital process to evaluate their work uh, really speaks to the measure of their expertise. Um, but if we take everything going on here and then we look for a contemporary image that reinforces the same kind of pr uh, process, you can very easily look at um, Peter Shashitsky and his work on uh, The Empire Strikes Back for Lucasfilm uh, and look at C-3PO, for instance. I mean, this might as well be the man in armor, if you ask me. Uh, how do the highlights work? What kind of sources are reflecting in C-3PO's uh, carapace and his faceplate, right? Um, and is it similar in a lot of ways to this fellow here? I think it is. Um, and I think that it's resonant of a lot of the same inspiration that um, Pete Shashisky is an English cinematographer. I've worked with him uh, uh, once before and uh, very smart uh, cinematographer. Uh, very attentive to detail. So here's a guy that, you know, he's European, uh, got access to a lot of incredible museums and a lot of um, artwork present in the environment and in the museums and he can access it. Uh, and so he might have a pretty uh, good understanding of how to light and render a situation like this, just based on seeing stuff like this at the local uh, you know, I've been to the um, National Gallery in London, a fantastic resource. Uh, you know, they've got, uh, for instance, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Madonna on the Rocks hanging 50 feet from the 
the main entrance of the museum, right? Uh, the first time that I went there, I never got any further than that one painting. And I just sat there in awe for two over two hours, just looking at a vintage Leonardo uh, fresco, eight feet tall, four feet wide, uh, a depiction, uh, a fanciful prediction of Mary and the, uh, and the, the, um, the child Christ uh, in a hypothetical backdrop, but just the, the quality of the rending, the degree of complexity was astounding. And, and so, you know, if you can access this kind of stuff uh, on your own, go to the museum, go to whatever art museum you have available to you. We don't have much in Orlando. It's a little bit of a culture desert here, <laughs> um, but we do have a museum in Orlando and there are some things and they they do uh, from time to time get visiting uh, content that you can go and look at. For instance, they've had Warhols uh, in Orlando before. They've had um, Ansel Adams, uh, uh, in Orlando before on display uh, on loan from other museums uh, and certainly you know museums like the Met in uh, New York uh, the Getty uh, I used to go to the Getty and the Norton Simon in Los Angeles uh, the MoMA Museum of Modern Art in Los Angeles I mean if you can go to these places and just experience some of this uh, art in person face to face um, I do truly believe that there is there is something is transferred there there is some knowledge there is some inspiration that gets transferred by being in the presence of this amazing work uh face to face and not looking at it in a book but if books are, are the best you can do there's a lot of them out there uh one of the things that i used to love to do would be to go to uh, borders for instance or barnes and noble and look at all the great art books that they used to have on clearance and get these amazing books for you know pennies on the dollar on clearance uh, and so as a result it, you end up with <laughs> you know your own personal library at home with hundreds if not you know if if not more uh resources um that you can look at for inspiration consult for uh information and um and educate yourself beyond you know what we have time to talk about in school um here's another great example of where our inspiration comes from this is the suicide of cleopatra by barbary circa 1621 if you know or understand the story of cleopatra she was um uh, caught in an illicit affair with Mark Anthony while she was married to one of the governors of the Roman Empire. And uh, as a result of her um, illicit affair, uh, she was condemned uh, to death. Kind of an extreme uh, sentencing, if you ask me, but in that time period, uh, the, such was the nature of ethics and law. And so uh, she chose, uh, she got to choose the manner with which she was executed and she chose death by adder, which is a poisonous uh, snake. And so this depiction is uh, Cleopatra taking the adder out of the straw basket so that it can bite her and inject her with the lethal venom and put her to sleep, uh, mortally uh, wounded. Um, and you can see the quality of the lighting and the drama of the posturing all sort of indicating what's going on in the scene, right? So she is appealing to the heavens. Why are you forsaking me or forgive me for what I've done? The contrast is speaking to the drama of the moment. There's deep shadow happening here with very hard transition highlight uh, revealing certain detail and shadow concealing other detail. The notion that a subject that is half lit has a psychological connotation, that being con conflict, indecision, um, the, the idea that the character might be hiding something. Uh, in this case, um, uh, deeply conf conflicted, right? I'm married to this guy who's the governor of the, you know, whatever portion of the empire that this guy was in charge of. Uh, but I'm in love with this other guy over here, right? And I don't know what I should do, right? And so I had an affair and I'm sorry, you know, what can I say? But I've been condemned to death and now I'm going to get bit by this snake. And so that's kind of all the stuff going on um, 
narratively in this image and you know we see reflected in the lighting and the and the framing and composition all of the drama uh, that's taking place without needing a soundtrack or without needing a dialogue uh, to tell us what's going on all you need to know is it's Cleopatra and then look at the situation and if you know the legend if you know the story then it all sort of becomes clear what's going on uh what else have i got here and so from contemporary uh filmmaking i chose the godfather because i felt like the lighting that uh, gordon willis used particularly in this opening scene was very reminiscent uh to something like barbary or even to something by um uh by caravaggio right the chiaroscuro the uh the opening classic opening scene of the godfather where um, the undertaker uh, comes to Don Vito Corleone and asks him to uh, give him justice for the um, for the assault and the rape of his daughter by the town by the boys from the town, and so we get um, uh, a scene that has some very uh, deep insinuations about revenge and about um behavior that's outside of the law and the fact that this guy is is able to sort of take liberties with um uh the execution of of men who are accused of of, of uh unsavory behavior and all of those tones and messaging uh would be sort of wasted on a brightly lit situation um, and so Gordon Willis understood this, and as a result, he he chose very specific lighting qualities, directionality, hardness, color, tonality, um, to reinforce the ideas of this is something that's happening outside of the context of law and order. This is a guy who operates in the shadows, who is capable of these very uh, complex and dangerous things and that there are people who will come to him in their time of need and ask for this person's um, participation in their problem in the solving of their problem and so this scene has a lot of um, a lot of kinetic energy and it has a lot of drama um, that is being translated by the lighting and camera movement and camera work uh, in this scene right and so if you take all of that sort of intention and all of the the design and you look at something like uh girl with a letter uh by rotari um and then you talk about color theory and you talk about light quality and you talk about composition and framing and we know the title of this this piece girl with a letter we can figure out a lot about what's going on here Okay, if we look at the color of the dress, it's red. And we know from last week when we, when we talked about color, red has psychological connotations to it, right? Passion, love, um, energy, uh, maybe not good, but slightly evil intention. Um, but it's a, it's a young woman, right? So what's the likelihood that this is an evil person? Not very likely at all. So the strong likelihood is that she's wearing red because she's a passionate individual and red indicates love. And what kind of letter might she be writing? A love letter, right? It's 1755 and she's a debutante, right? Maybe this is a secret lover. Uh, and as a result of that, she is predominantly in shadow. Her face is in shadow. She's turned away from the light. Right in 1755, you weren't supposed to have forbidden lovers, right? Uh, you were supposed to maintain your virtue and you were supposed to get married and then you were supposed to have uh, affairs like this. But she's talking to somebody about something maybe she's not supposed to be talking about. And so she's turned away from the light of societal norm. Her intentions are in shadow, but her passion is for the person she's writing to. And so this is probably a love letter right? Reinforced by the red sealing wax that she's going to use to close the letter uh, from prying eyes so that it can be delivered uh, specifically to, you know, the desired recipient, okay? Um, and the scene itself is not broadly lit. It's a fairly dark room. So 
we, you know, that further reinforces the notion that what's happening here is something that's happening outside of the observation of her parents, maybe. Um, it's happening in the, the shadows and recesses of her bedroom. And she's talking to somebody that she's probably not supposed to be talking to, right? We can get all of that from all of these ideas I'm talking about, right? And then can we think of a situation where we've seen this in contemporary cinema? And I thought of, you know, the Blade Runner uh, movies, right? This is, um, uh, this is 2049, um, but it's uh, a scene that was crafted in the spirit of the original film from 1982. Um, and it was uh, shot by, um, 2049 was shot by Roger Deakins. Um, Blade Runner uh, from 1982 was shot by uh, Jordan Cronenworth, Cronenworth uh, whose son Jeff is a contemporary cinematographer who works a lot with, um, I think he works with David Fincher a lot. Um, and so we have a lot of the same sentiment, a lot of the tonality, color quality, directionality, and, and hardness, softness of um, classical lighting at work on Rachel. This is Rachel or the robot uh, known as Rachel. Um, and you can see through the lighting and through the framing, we're supposed to feel a certain way about Rachel. We're supposed to feel the love for her that this is an over the shoulder on Harrison Ford. So Harrison Ford played Decker from the original film. And by the end of the original Blade Runner, and this might be a spoiler, and if it is, I'm sorry, but at the end of the original Blade Runner movie, uh, we had Decker faced with a, with a conundrum or a couple of conundrums. First of all, uh, um, he knew that Rachel was a replicant or a robot but he wasn't convinced that she knew that she was a robot and therefore he was conflicted about revealing the truth to her. And at the same time, he had grown to love this character regardless of her, um, her um, uh, state of being a robot. Um, she was so convincingly human, more human than human, if you will, directly from the dialogue uh, in an earlier scene um that uh, we he loved her and we're supposed to feel the same way so that we can understand the character of decker how does how does he feel about rachel he loves rachel and look at the lighting it's warm it's soft and and sort of directional um it's it reveals a delicacy of tone and texture in the face of this individual very female, very appealing look at the vitality the catch light in the eye the red lipstick um, everything about this image is designed for the audience to feel the same sort of love and compassion for her that Harrison Ford's character feels, right? Um, and we can extend that sort of emotion and intent to things like uh, the self-portrait by uh, Marie Bouliard from 1785. So here's a, um, a woman, uh, not quite a debutante, but certainly still youthful. Um, and available and she is doing a self-portrait uh, and she is this is how this woman saw herself at, maybe at the sort of pinnacle of her vitality and her um, position uh, in society and so she has depicted herself in very broadly lit terms soft and low contrast, but directional enough to reveal the feminine qualities and aspects of her face and body. Um, she's chosen neutral and brightly colored garments, gold and red to indicate um, passion and station, um, and a very dark sort of environment that helps create the focal point of this woman's face, the catch light in the eyes to indicate her youthful vitality, the rosy quality in her cheeks and the redness of her lips, all of this designed to make her feminine and appealing um, in her um, moment in time, right? And so maybe a correlating image from contemporary cinema might be uh, Sally from when Harry met Sally. And this is uh, from the scene in the deli where um, Billy Crystal's character uh, is talking to Meg Ryan and they're trying to figure out why they've never been steady boyfriend and girlfriend uh, throughout the course of their lives. Um, and in this particular scene, uh, Meg Ryan is supposed to 
look to the audience like the object of desire and why doesn't Billy Crystal's character want to hook up with her and, and you know, make it a, a permanent deal. And that's part of the conundrum of the film. That's the tension that the filmmaker was trying to give to the audience is the, the tragedy of the fact that despite how these two characters felt for one another, for some reason, for one reason or another, they could never quite get their act together so that they could become an item together. Uh, and they waste a lot of time and, and, the, and the film takes place over the course of, I think, like 10 or 15 years of these two people sort of passing each other like ships in a night, right? Why aren't they hooking up? Why aren't they getting together? This is so frustrating as the audience is sitting there going, why doesn't Billy Crystal see Meg Ryan as this perfect woman that he would want to be with? What, what's his problem, right? And that's how the audience is supposed to feel in, in this film. And then at the end of the film, they finally do get together. And, and, and as a result, we, we have a catharsis where the audience is relieved to find out that eventually Billy Crystal's character comes around and sees the light, if you will. And this is, you know, so this lighting for Meg Ryan specifically in this scene was designed to make us feel all of the reasons why he should want her as evidenced on the screen, right? There it is. Um, I think kind of counter to this discussion now would be a situation like this one, which is a, a different kind of image uh, created by uh, Alexander Cabanel. Uh, called The Countess of Keller uh, from 1873. And this is a situation where an artist is, is uh, sort of superimposing all of the masculine traits of an image, the lighting and, and, and contrast and tonality that might be reserved for male subjects. And he's using them on a female subject. And I think part of the reason why is that uh, Cabanel wants us to know that the Countess of Keller is a powerful, um, maybe uh, somewhat intense individual. And as a result, the lighting is very hard. The shadows are contrasty. Uh, she's mass, she has a masculine quality to her lighting. Look, she's almost lit like a Rembrandt would light himself. Certainly not the way Marie Bouliard saw herself um, but uh, Cabanel said, look, a powerful woman might have the same intensity of a man who's equally powerful in the same time period. And so her lighting should reflect that condition. Uh, she shouldn't be softly and beautifully lit if we want to feel like this woman is powerful and capable. And so he gave her very masculine and very contrasty lighting as a result, which may not favor her in terms of her beauty, but certainly reinforces her station. Um, and so you get an intensity here um, that's very deliberate and it's, and, and it's um, possessing uh, qualities that we might reserve for masculine subjects in the same situation. And so therefore in, in a movie like, um, uh, uh, Black Swan uh, by Aronofsky, um, his cinematographer, uh, Matty Lebetique, used the same kind of approach to uh, the character, uh, Natalie Portman's, uh, not Natalie Portman's character, but Mila Kunis plays the antithesis in this particular film. Um, but both of these women are hard and competitive because they're both ballerinas working uh, and competing for the, um, the lead um, position in a, uh, a, a theater depiction of the Black Swan um, uh, suite. And so Natalie Portman is the star, Mila Kunis is the understudy, and it's about the conflict and competition between the, um, the woman who's, who, who has the opportunity and the woman who wants to seize the opportunity and make it her own. Right. And so the lighting has to be sort of hard and and counterintuitive to the notions of female subjects being lovable and warm and soft and feminine. Um, and it and it says, no, these are two uh, competitive, strong, um, focused individuals. And so their lighting has to reflect those feelings. Right. Um, and so these are kind of, and having worked with Maddie uh, a couple of times, I can tell you that his processes 
for thinking about and executing um, his lighting and composition uh, are very informed. A lot of research goes into it and a lot of thought goes into, you know, what kind of light, where do you put it? What color is it? Is it hard or soft? Um, and any work that you look at uh, lit by Maddie, um, the longer you look at it and the more you approach it in these sort of deconstructive terms, you can see the choices that were made and you can see how uh, everything is sort of deliberately um, applied to the story. Um, and so, you know, we I can keep going with this. I've got Nighthawks by Edward Hopper and I've got Ex Machina by uh, Rob Hardy and Alex Garland. And, and a lot of the same principles apply here. These are feelings of isolation. I gave you a really great documentary. Uh, I added that to your video list that deconstructs Nighthawks by Hopper and talks about his emotional state when he created this piece and uh, what was happening in the world of 1942, uh, particularly in New York City and globally in the world and, and how those um, realities uh, affected the tone uh, of this particular painting and the research and deliberate nature with which Hopper uh, executed this painting is, I think you find it very informative. It's um, it's a about a half an hour documentary. I would watch it uh, as, you know, sort of extracurricular to uh, the subject of, of lighting, um, but for your own information and enrichment, I think it's a very interesting uh, film. So I, I put it up there for you to look at. And I think a lot of the same approaches were taken by Hardy in the cinematography for Ex Machina, um, particularly the, the scenes where um, uh, where uh, the robot um, played by uh, Alicia Vikander is sort of um, analyzed and interrogated by um, the character um, played by, um, gosh, I, his name escapes me at the moment. Um, um, this 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 man is brought in to sort of determine whether or not this robot is truly sentient AI or if it's just a really, really good simulation of machine intelligence. And so um, he's behind glass, this uh, character, the, the, the robot, uh, this is her living quarters. And so we have a situation where the two of them are observing each other through glass and who's truly the prisoner and who's truly the evaluator. Uh, we start um, playing a game of cat and mouse and the and the tones and the messaging is all very sort of jumbled and Garland is playing games with the audience to sort of make you feel a certain way about, uh, this is Domnell Gleeson, by the way, I, I finally popped into my head. How do we feel about Domnell's character? How do we feel about Alicia's character? And then do we turn those feelings on their head by the end of the movie? Um, very deliberate, very intentional, right? So if we're gonna do this kind of thing, what are we gonna do? We're gonna start with three-point lighting and we're going to attack the problem from directionality, color and contrast, hardness and softness of our lighting. The first light we're gonna employ is what we call a key light. The key light is responsible for establishing the shape, texture, color, and by its placement, tone, of the image through this one light, right? The other two lights, the fill light and the back light are, are intended to support what the key light is doing. So if the key light is providing all that stuff, shape, texture, tone, color, quality, what's the fill light doing? Well, by virtue of its name, fill, uh, it is simply illuminating the shadows. How much detail do you wanna see in the shadows? How much contrast do you want those shadows to create? Do you want it to be like a Caravaggio using heavy chiaroscuro? Or do you want it to be a little bit more broadly and brightly lit? The fill light helps you control the contrast of your image. And then if you have a subject against a dark background like we had uh, with Marie Bouliard's self-portrait uh, or with any of the Rembrandts for that matter or some of the other images I've showed you, uh, do you want to light up the background or not? If you don't light up the background, how are you going to get that subject to stand out against a dark background? You might want to include a light on the background itself to just give you a little difference in contrast that helps define the shape of your subject. You might want to use a deliberate um, edge light uh, like you might see uh, Meg Ryan's hair, for instance, is lit up with a highlight that helps distinguish it in tone from a similarly colored wall in the background. 
Um, or do you want to, you know, uh, go without and just use the one light source? It's entirely up to you, but three point lighting uh, is going to help you establish that three dimensional look in a two dimensional medium. The key light defines shape, color, texture, and tone. The fill light controls contrast and the backlight helps separate your subject from the background to create depth. Okay. And those three lights in those ways are the three point lighting approach and they are a way in which we create uh, dimensionality and render the drama of our scenes. Okay. Um, the links to my four part series are here. Uh, you can see these in the PDF uh, or I've given them to you on your videos page. Um, and so that leads me to, uh, we kind of just did this so I can skip over a lot of this. Um, that kind of leads me to uh, the discussion of the software, the um, virtual lighting studio. Um, your assignment is going to ask you to evaluate uh, or show me um, through arrow icons and labeling uh, what light you intended to be your key light, your fill light, and your edge light. And you're going to use the virtual lighting studio uh, to illustrate those ideas. So if I take you, I, this is an active link, if I take you to the link um, and show you the website, uh oh this never works right i'm just gonna go i have it i have it loaded into my uh tabs already um let me just go to virtual lighting studio when you open up the software you're going to get this sort of blank page and it sometimes will have a couple of ad banners right there we go ad banners running down the side uh, if you want to use it for free, you're going to have to contend with these ad banners. They can be distracting, but you can work around them. You can pay for the software and then you don't get any ads, but I don't recommend doing that since um, you know this is just for practice and for fun. You can access it for free uh, and maybe just, you know, um, figure out a way to sort of tune those out. But just hit the start button and it's going to take you to this virtual studio uh, interface. And the first thing you're going to want to do is pick your uh, avatar, right? So you have a uh, bald white guy. You got a uh, white guy with hair. You have a um, young woman, uh, redhead or, or um, strawberry uh, blonde, if you will. Uh, and then you have person of color. And that's it. Those are the only four avatars you get to choose from, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the reflectivity of people with color, the difference between female and male rendering can be practiced here. And then there's something about, um, you know, bald guys, which are a little bit harder to light for the, for the problem of highlights and, and separation. Um, and so the difference between having hair and not having hair will affect some of your lighting choices. So I think in that way, you get most of the um, benefit uh, of the software with this limited number of avatars. Uh, it's a shame there's not more, but um, you know, you're know you gonna have to make one of these four uh, characters work for you in your figure study. And then you have the option of looking at the virtual space uh, in a graphic form uh, where your avatar is situated in the center of the frame. We have sort of a three-dimensional box going on here and we can actually move our lighting um, left and right by using these actuation controls down here. Um, if I just scroll a little bit and see if I can see both things at once, kind of can't really. Um, here, that might work forward and backward uh, the light source can be moved it can be moved up and down in height right and then side to side and, and when you do that uh, obviously look here there's a little thumbnail if i click on it it's going to show me what that light position did to my avatar okay so if i want to uh make this uh more of a rembrandt style light i might bring that source around just a little bit more i might raise it up above eye level probably like so 
Um, and then does it need to move closer or further away? It might need to be further away. And then I might give it, um, by virtue of gel, I might give it a warmth like a Rembrandt image might have. And if I go back and check my avatar, I start to see that sort of Rembrandt shape emerging um, by the way I placed that key light in virtual space. Now, remember, I, I, I called it a key light, right? This is my first light. It's establishing the shape and directionality, the color. I chose a gel, a warm gel. Um, and then is it hard or soft? Well, this is fairly hard. I can apply diffusion. Uh, I can certainly do that. I can also change the brightness of the source. If I go back to my illustration, um, I can change this. Let's say I can make it a little bit bright. Oh, use the plus and minus. I can make it a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. Let's go a little bit darker. Let's go minus one EV or one exposure value and take a look at what it does. See that there, what it does to the brightness of the key light. Now, I have a lot of shadow going on here and very little detail visible in that shadow. So I can do things. I can add a fill light. Uh oh, I just flattened everything out. What did I do? Well, if I go to here, I look, oh, oh, it's right in front of the camera lens. It's directly hitting the subject. Where do I want it to go? A fill light usually happens directly opposite to the key light. So I'm going to move it around this way. Maybe I'm going to go back with it quite a ways and I'm going to probably make it if my key light is minus one EV, I'll probably make this minus two or maybe minus four. And if I take a look at my avatar now, oh, look at that. I filled in the shadow uh, and lowered the contrast. What did I have before? I can turn the light off and I can do what we call ABing it to see what that fill light just did. It lowered the contrast of the shadows. It dug into the low side eye. It finished you know, defining the shape of the character's head. And there's a suggestion because I came around pretty far to the side that it's starting to possess the qualities of an edge light. I could actually put a more deliberate edge light back there. If I add another light, boom, and I flattened them out. So I got to move this. I'm going to move it around way around to the back. And I'm going to move it away, far away, maybe go around even a little bit more. And then I'm going to lower that to at least the level of the key light. And if I look at what it did, it created this little bit of separation here, defines the jawline, which is why we call this light a, a cheeker or a backlight, because it's coming from behind the subject. And it's just putting a little bit of definition on the cheek, right? And it's coming from the low side, so it's opposite from the side of the key. And it helps to separate the subject from the background. So by all those definitions, it is certainly a backlight. The fill light is certainly lowering the contrast and filling in the shadows. So by definition, that is a successful light. And this key light defined the shape, color, and texture, and quality of the source. And so for all those reasons, uh, I've got a nice three-point situation going on. Now, because of the height of the key light, I don't have much of a twinkle in the eye. There's a little bit happening here from the fill light, but not much happening in this eye from the key light. I could add a fourth light just for the eye light if I wanted to. Take it way down in intensity so that all it is is a point source in the eye. Move it closer to the subject to make that point source a little bit bigger. And... Um, I can add a fourth light to this situation. I lowered it so much in exposure that it's not competing with what the key light's doing or with what the fill light is doing. It's just putting that other twinkle in the subject's eye uh, to help with the vitality. So that's a four light setup, right? I could keep going if I want, but the more lights I add, the flatter this image is gonna get. So I wanna limit my choices to one, two, three, or maybe four lights uh, so that I don't just muddy the whole thing up into a homogenous mess that it really can't derive any meaning from. And then I can decide how many of these lights do I want? If I turn the eye light out, what do I get? If I turn the fill light out, what do I get? Maybe you like this more than the three, the full three-point lighting setup. If that's the case and it works for your story, go with it. 
But what I want you to do for the assignment is give me a properly lit three point lighting simulation first and then just do a, you know, a clip grab or a frame grab Do your um, what is it here it's um, control command four, I think on the Apple or shift command four. Uh, and it'll give you, uh, you can drag and drop a little window and it will take a picture of what you've done here and save it to your desktop as a JPEG or, a, or as a PNG. And that is going to become part of your submission for the homework assignment. Then after you've done a, a nice, uh, well-crafted three-point lighting sample, I want you to show me an alternative like maybe what I just talked about, turn the fill light off, go to your edge light and add maybe a blue gel to it and, you know, be daring and make your key light even warmer so that you get that 3D opposite, chromatic opposite effect going on, foreground, background, competing to create depth in this, in this narrow space right and then you know play with your fill light maybe you make it a little bit darker so that the contrast is a little is is still heavy but not real heavy if you turned it completely off but just heavy enough at minus five ev that it fills in the shadows a little bit but doesn't spoil the quality and color of your edge light or the quality and color of your of your key light right and then maybe if we pop that fill light back on and just lower it a little bit more there, you know, that might be a nice alternative to your traditional three point scheme um, and show me that as an alternative. So you're going to show me a well-crafted deliberate three point lighting setup. And then you're going to show me a variation setup with the same software Sn snippet or clip grab both shots, put them on a word doc, Label the shots so that I know which light is your key light, which light is your edge light, which light is your fill light. And then tell me a little bit something about your process of coming up with that scheme and coming up with the variation. You know, a paragraph would be sufficient. That's going to be your homework assignment. And all of those instructions are on the homework assignment page. Um, that's basically what you're going to do. Okay. So this is Virtual Lighting Studio. It's at ZVORK dot fr uh, i think that's means dot france in the internet terms uh and then backslash vls uh backslash okay zvork dot fr okay and that link is in your homework assignment directions as well okay this will be your last assignment for the class and you'll submit this by sunday night at midnight along with your final quiz okay so uh that is what I have for you today, that is the lighting discussion. I think I took it to a full two hours. It's kind of a, a lengthy discussion when we get into the weeds with the classical art, but I think it's worth it. Um, at this point, um, I want to sort of adjourn the session, but what I would, uh, what I will do for you guys uh, very quickly is entertain any questions that you might have uh, pertaining to uh, the lighting discussion or the assignment, um, uh, we can we can discuss those concerns now, or you can send me an email if you want to have a private discussion. We can also do a private Zoom if if that works for you. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, or comments about today's discussion? Should we adjourn the discussion for the day? Then I'll take thumbs up as an indication that uh, you guys are good to go with this. I've got one uh, confirmation. Do I have a second? I have a second. So Chance and Chris, thank you very much for uh, uh, contributing. And I will then uh, adjourn the conversation for today. Thank you for your time and attention. Again, if you have any questions, reach out to me through WebCourse's email and I'll uh, respond back as soon as I can. Don't forget the homework assignment. Don't forget the final quiz. If you're late on anything, please get it all in by the end of the week this week, because like I said, there's no room for uh, stragglers uh, in summer A. Um, the grades have to be in by Tuesday afternoon. There's no way around that. That's a UCF requirement. So um, this is it. This is our last week, folks. I'll see you Thursday for a discussion on uh, composition and framing. Um, and then after that, um, you will have successfully completed cinematography one for the summer term 2022. 
All right. Thanks so much for your time and attention today. And I'll see you guys again on Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.